that the priests of the higher collegia, and especially the consuls, who originally enjoyed a sacred character themselves, were to be chosen only from patrician families. In this context, the need for a unitary authority was affirmed together with the instinctive acknowledgement that such an authority has a stronger foundation in those cases in which the race of the blood and the race of the spirit converge. Let us now examine the case of kings who have not been raised to a super-individual dignity through initiation, but rather through an investiture or a consecration that is mediated by a priestly caste. This formation is typical of more recent historical times. The primordial theocracies did not derive their authority from a church or from a priestly caste. The Nordic kings were kings immediately by virtue of their divine origin, and just like the kings of the Doric Achaean period, they were the only celebrants of sacrificial actions. In China, the emperor received his mandate directly from heaven. Until recently in Japan, the ritual of enthronement took place in the context of the individual spiritual experience of the emperor, who established contact with the influences of the regal tradition without the presence of an officiating clergy. Even in Greece and in Rome, the priestly collegia did not make kings through their rights, but limited themselves to exercising the divinatory science in order to ascertain whether the person appointed to exercise the regal function was found pleasing to the gods. In other words, it was an issue of acknowledgement and not of investiture, as in the ancient Scottish tradition concerning the so-called Stone of Destiny. Conversely, at the origins of Rome, the priesthood was conceived as some kind of emanation of the primitive regality, and the king himself promulgated the laws regulating the cult. After Romulus, who was himself initiated to the divinatory art, Numa delegated the typically priestly functions of the collegium of the Flamines, which he himself instituted. At the time of the empire, the priestly body was again subjected to the authority of the Caesars just like the Christian clergy later became subjected to the Byzantine emperor. In Egypt, until the 21st dynasty, the king delegated a priest, designated as the king's priest, to perform the rites only sporadically, and the spiritual authority itself always represented a reflection of the royal authority. The Paleo-Egyptian Nutirhan parallels the role often played in India by the Purohita, who was a Brahmana employed at court and in charge of performing fire sacrifices. The Germanic races ignored consecration up to the Carolingian era. Charlemagne crowned himself, and so did Ludovicus and Pius, who later crowned his own son, Lothar, without any direct involvement on the part of the Pope. The same holds true for the earlier forms of all traditional civilization, including the historical cycles of pre-Columbian America, and especially for the Peruvian dynasty of the Solar Masters, or Incas. On the contrary, when a priestly caste or a church claims to be the exclusive holder of that sacred force that alone can empower the king to exercise his function, this marks the beginning of an involutive process. A spirituality that in and of itself is not regal, and conversely a regality that is not spiritual, eventually emerged. This spirituality and this regality enjoyed separate existences. Also, a feminine spirituality and a material virility began to coexist jointly with a lunar sacredness and a material solarity. The original synthesis, which corresponded to the primordial regal attribute of the glory, or of the celestial fire of the conquerors, was dissolved and the plane of absolute centrality was lost. We shall see later on that such a split marks the beginning of the descent of civilizations and the direction that has led to the genesis of the modern world. Once the fracture occurred, the priestly caste portrayed itself as the caste in charge of attracting and transmitting spiritual influences but without being capable of constituting their dominating center with the temporal order. This dominating center, instead, was virtually present in the quality of a warrior or a nobleman of the king to whom the rite of consecration communicated these influences, the Holy Spirit in the Catholic tradition, so that he may assume them and actualize them in an efficient form. Thus, in more recent times, it is only through this priestly mediation and through a rites virtus deificans that the synthesis of the regal and priestly dimensions is reconstituted, a synthesis that is supposed to be the supreme hierarchical peak of a traditional social order. It is only in this way that the king again can be something more than a mere mortal. Likewise, in the Catholic ritual, the dress a king was supposed to wear before the rite of the investiture was simply a military dress. It is only in later times that a king began to wear the regal dress during the ceremony and began the tradition of sitting on an elevated place, that had been reserved for him in the church. 
the rigorously symbolical meaning of the various phases of the ceremony has been preserved almost up to modern times. It is significant to find in older times the recurrent use of the expression regal religion, for which the enigmatic figure of Melchizedek was often evoked. Already in the Merovingian era, in reference to the king, we find the formula Melchizedek Noster Merito Rex Atic Sacerdos. The king who, during the rite, took off the dress that he previously put on was believed to be one who leaves the mundane state in order to assume the state of regal religion. In A.D. 769, Pope Stephanus III reminded the Carolingians that they were a sacred race and a royal priesthood. Regal consecration was bestowed through anointing. Back in those times, this rite differed from the rite of consecration of bishops only in a few minor details, and therefore the king became as holy as a priest before men and God. Anointing, which belonged to the Jewish tradition, and which was eventually taken up by Catholicism, was the habitual rite employed to transfer a being from a profane into a sacred world. According to the Ghibelline ideal, it was thanks to his virtue that the consecrated person became a Deus Homo in spiritu el virtu Christus Domini in una eminentia divinificationis sumus et instructor sancte ecclesiae. Therefore, it was said that the king must stand out from the mass of lay people, since he participates in the priestly function by having his been anointed by consecrated oil. The anonymous author of York wrote, quote, The king, the Christ, anointed of the Lord, cannot be regarded as being a layman, end quote. In the sporadic emergence of the idea that the right of regal consecration has the power to erase every sin committed, including those that involved the shedding of blood, we find an echo of the above-mentioned initiatory doctrine concerning the transcendence of the supernatural quality vis-à-vis -vis any human virtue or sin. In this chapter, I have discussed initiation in relation to the positive function of regality, even when considered in material terms. I have also mentioned instances in which the initiatory dignity separated itself from that function, or better, instances in which that function separated itself from the initiatory dignity by becoming secularized and by taking on a merely warrior or political character. Initiation must also be considered, however, as an independent category of the world of tradition without a necessary relation to the exercise of a visible function at the center of a society. Initiation, high-level initiation, not to be confused with initiation that is related to the regimen of the castes or to the traditional professions and the various artisan guilds, has defined in and of itself the action that determines an ontological transformation of man. High-level initiation has generated initiatory chains that were often invisible and subterranean and that preserved an identical spiritual influence and an inner doctrine superior to the exoteric and religious forms of a historical tradition. There are even instances in which the initiate has enjoyed this distinct character in a normal civilization and not only during the ensuing period of degeneration and inner fracture of the traditional unity. This character has become necessary and all-pervasive, especially in Europe in these latter times because of the involutive processes that have led both to the organization of the modern world and to the advent of Christianity.